Okay, we're live and public. We're right? live. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So I'm going to go ahead and post this link on the uh, event page. So sure. So people, people want to come on in, uh, they yep. can. Okay. <clears throat> All right. So, uh, greetings, everybody who may or may not be watching this on uh, YouTube via the Hangouts on Air. Uh, my name is Vince Kingston, uh, owner, operator, general, and general all-round uh, person, I guess, for Bygone Futures, a small self pub. Uh, with me tonight is Mark Diaz Truman, uh, owner operator of Magpie Games. Now I'll let Mark uh, Mark introduce himself with regards to uh, who he is exactly. So I'm Mark. I'm the lead developer for Magpie Games. Uh, we got started last year with our uh, Kickstarter for the Play the Thing, which is a Shakespearean <coughs> RPG. Uh, we just finished up our second Kickstarter for uh, our last Best Hope. Which was, uh, which is going to come out at Gen Con, and it's a game about uh, saving the world from a terrible crisis that's going to destroy humanity. So uh, I work with a partner, my girlfriend Marissa Kelly. She does all the art, I do all the writing, and um, we're really excited to be bringing out the second game for Gen Con. Uh, and I'm excited to be here today to talk about the business side of it. How does it get printed? How do you pay the bills? How do you make all that stuff work? So I'm excited to be here. Big thanks to Vince for setting it up. Hey, not a problem, Mark. Um, just a little bit more about myself. Uh, I am still relatively unknown. Uh, I am an author, primarily. I have a short story out right now, my first one. It's taken a little bit longer than I had hoped to get out in the world, but uh, it's called Tales of Lancaster's Folly. It's uh, urban fantasy. Uh, currently working on another short story, as well as a novel set in the same universe, as well as some RPG material. Uh, set on the set in the universe. Uh, most of that will be coming out, unfortunately, after Gen Con, uh, as I also work a full-time job uh, as a senior accountant for a large Nordic level, actually European level consulting firm. Uh, we also, I've also partnered up with uh, Andrew Sanderson, who's another author based out of Australia. Uh, he's a great bloke. He's got a Short story out under our title, our, uh, out under our uh, banner right now. It's called The Dragon's Spine. Uh, it's a little fantasy short story, as well as he's also self-published his own novel, Area, which is available on Amazon right now. Um, all of my titles are also obviously available on Amazon as well as Drive Through Fiction. Um, Unlike Mark, who's been out and about in the real world there for a while, I'm still relatively new. Uh, Bygone's only officially been in existence for less than a year. That said, I myself have been heavily involved, uh, especially in the online tabletop community for the past, oh geez, uh, almost 10 years. Um, <coughs> starting with the original edition of Fantasy Grounds, where I was hired on by company called Digital Adventures uh, to be the line developer for their Savage Worlds conversions. Uh, so I've gotten to hang out with quite a few cool people. Um, it's also where I met Josh Owen. Josh Owen uh, is one of the lead developers behind Tabletop Forge, which is an app I'm sure many of you have heard about. Uh, just completed a very successful Kickstarter uh, to bring the app into um, and while it's usable now, obviously it's going to be a whole lot better with everything they have planned. I have a lot of faith in the guys behind Tabletop Forge, really hoping that uh, hopefully we, uh, we here at Bygone will be able to help them out. Uh, I think I've rambled on a lot longer than I had intended on uh, what I'm bringing to the table. Uh, as, I, as I've said, this is more of a high-level kind of uh, attempt at giving everybody a little bit of information on what can you expect uh, if you choose to 
get into the world of self-publishing, uh, independent publishing for yourselves. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a lot of work, uh, but with great, uh, as, as the old saying goes, with great power comes with great responsibility. So, you know, you've, um, we've all got our parts to play and you can get a lot of happiness and a lot of reward out of it if you're willing to put in the effort. So, one, one thing is, no, uh, we're going to get into is, <coughs> should you do this full-time or part-time? Uh, to start with, and really, that's all going to depend on your personal situation. I myself, because of how expensive things are here in Denmark, uh, can't afford to do this completely full time on my own yet. Um, obviously, so I still work a full time job and do everything that I do in the two to three hours an evening I have to myself, uh, as well as jug uh, juggling, you know. Uh, family responsibilities. Uh, I have my wife, who is also a gamer, but you know we still have to take the time together sometimes. So there's uh, a lot of juggling going on. Um, I think that this is probably the most misunderstood thing about about running a game company is that you know making it work as a full time position is extraordinarily difficult. Just because of the economics of it. I mean, you know, we did a Kickstarter uh, this last month that hit twelve thousand dollars, and that sounds fantastic. We were thrilled with that. But of that, only a small amount is actually profit, meaning money we get after we pay everybody that's involved with the book and produce the book and produce the rewards. Yeah. And that would mean that if this was my full-time job, I would really be struggling. So, you know, I think when I look when I talk to people about what does it take to to you know, start your own game design company. Um, part of it is you've got to give yourself the, uh, the the cushion of having some other form of income. Because if this is your only form of income, it's going to be a really, everything's going to matter a lot, and you're going to be afraid to make mistakes, and it's going to be really difficult. Yeah. Uh, but for me, you know, I'm a student, a graduate student now. Um, I own another business that's that's a more of a, a you know, I call it a, a real business. It's a, it's a tutoring business, and I've been working at that for, you know, seven years. So it's a very full and, uh, and profitable business that I can you know, draw some income from. So between those various forms, Magpie is a very small piece that I spend a lot of time on and invest a lot of love into, but it's not what I'm counting on my full-time income for exactly the same reasons that Vince just said, because I have bills yeah. to pay, you know, and it's, it's, you know, it's cheap to live in, uh, in the place that I live, but it, it's not so cheap I can do it for free. No, exactly. And the other thing uh, from all the freelancers and other self-pubs that I've spoken with over the years, you know, the idea of having a health insurance plan, um, especially in those countries that don't have public uh, funded health care is very important. So, you know, there's just something that you can't give up, you know, uh, as much as you want to. Uh, do something like this full time. The reality of it is, you're never going to make the kind of level of income unless you get really lucky to s fully support uh, a family, yourself, ensure good health, a house over a roof over your head, food on the table. Uh, there are those who do do it, but they also work something like. Uh, I remember seeing something 60 to 80 hours in a week, you know, and that's all they do is they're just pushing out product, pushing out product, pushing out product. And while for, for some that's, that's a, a, an existence, you also have to balance it with reality. You know, you, you can't shut yourself in and just produce product. Um, I'm sure there are those who, who do, but uh, that's, to me that's not a good quality of life, you know. I like to have my friends around. I like to have everything. So finding that, as with a normal job, that work-life balance is extremely important. And in order to do that, you need to be able to reliably con uh, produce income. Now the one, the one thing that's changed, I think, you know, made church <coughs> this change before I entered the industry. But like one, the one thing that's changed about role-playing game design is that it's easier than ever to get started. Hmm. Right. Yeah. So it used to be like you'd have to, you know, maybe print something yourself and put up a whole lot of money to do so. 
or you know, if you had like a free adventure, you'd have to like fly to cons and like try to pass it out and make a name for yourself. You know, what we've been able to do with Kickstarter, uh, and you know, been able to do with like you know PDFs through drive-through means that like we could get started really easily and actually you know build that catalog of of products that's going to eventually uh, you know hopefully make a name for us when we when you come to our site and you see oh these people have. 15 or 20 games, yeah. where we've built that momentum and we're going to continue to build it. And because of those tools, uh, you know, you don't have to do it all at one time. So, I mean, I want people to take away the message that this is not going to be a full-time job tomorrow, but I also want them mm. to know it's easier than ever to make it a part-time job and to get your yeah. feet wet, and you should do so. Like, absolutely, yeah. try something, put out a free adventure. That's how you should start. Don't start yeah. by taking up a loan on your house. <laughs> Yeah. and trying to print your thousand page monstrosity fantasy heartbreaker get started yeah. with something small and build your reputation yeah exactly and that's and that's a, that's a good high level general advice for any business uh, you start small don't ever expect to become an overnight success it just will the, the odds of it happening are so stacked against you it's it's almost laughable you've got a better chance of being struck by lightning is uh, as you do becoming any kind of significant overnight success, um, the uh, you know, and it's going to take time. You know, the average business shuts its doors within the first five years. That's just it. That's a fact. Um, you know, so taking all that kind of in mind, build yourself small baby steps. You know, my the fir my first year. Uh, with bygone, I had this grandmaster scheme of creating this, you know, hundred thousand word opus of a of a game. What ended up happening? I ended up having five audits at my day job to go through. I had, uh, we had a, a significant changeover happen at the day job. We had, you know, new roles to become uh, to fill. It ended up I got so tired and distracted from my day job. I wasn't able to put in the effort and the and the time needed to get this side business side business up and running, and that's the other you know that's the other issue. Life interfered with what I had planned, which is what always happens. So, you know, build yourself in that short-term plan of one to two years. You know, right now my my plan for the 2012 year is have at least one more short story out one more no the novel finished and maybe my one ro uh, role playing product out you know, that's a reasonable goal i've got 6 months left in the year to do so yeah i think it's more than reasonable but the other thing is too you need to be professional with everything you do um, don't just slap together a word document put it up on rpg now and expect it to sell, you know. Be right. realistic with what you're with what you're going for. If you want a quality product out there, it will cost you money. Otherwise, you're going to end up doing it all yourself, um, and that's not realistic either. There's only so many hats a self pub can wear. Um, you know, I I think of myself as an okay author, an okay editor. But at bottom line, I still need somebody else to look over my stuff. And I'm not going to expect somebody else to look it over without getting some form of uh, remuneration for it. I don't, and Mark, Mark's lucky in that he's got an art resource built into his, his product plan. You know, I don't have that luxury. <laughs> so that's my biggest so I think problem. I, getting I, I, Hello, Mark? Oh, looks like Mark is... Yeah, sorry. Looks like you cut out there a minute. Yeah, I do. I'm, I'm very lucky that I don't you know, know if it's me or if it's Mark. Um, because, you know, she... <coughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm still here. Still having trouble? Yeah. Well, yeah, it looks like I, you're I can hear you out. okay. Um, you think that you know, you've got to okay. you've got to put that money out to to pay for things. Um, you know, when we first started, Marissa, the idea was going to be okay. Well, I'm going to do all the writing and editing, and Marissa was going to do all the art and layout, not just the art, but actually lay out the book too. 
she didn't really know all that much about doing that layout, and I didn't really know much about editing. And so when we got the Kickstarter for the plays, the thing funded, we actually realized that doing everything ourselves was gonna was gonna be a bad idea, right? It was gonna be hard enough for her to do all the art and hard enough for me to do all the writing without taking on those additional jobs. And so we ended up paying people to yep. do them. And we were lucky because the Kickstarter funded that, so we didn't have to put out any money out of pocket. But it also wasn't that expensive, right? So, like, if you find people mm -hmm. that you're, you're you're willing to work with who will do layout, who will do editing, you know, when I look for editing work, you know, you're you're talking about a couple of cents a word usually. So, like, you know, for a hundred thousand pay or hundred thousand word novel, you know, you might you might be looking at paying, you know, what a thousand dollars. Well, if your novel is mm -hmm. going to sell in various capacity, then that's actually not that big. An investment, right? If no. you think you can move a couple hundred, a couple thousand units in the novel, if you don't think you can do yeah. that yet, then maybe you should focus on releasing some products that maybe get you in the door before you release your yeah. amazing hundred thousand word novel. Yeah, so exactly. It's yeah, it's it's tough to. But you know, they never met you. Right, and they only yep. know you through this particular product that you're putting out. Mm -hmm. Yep. And as with everything, you know, first impressions are always important. You know, I think everybody, in the, especially in the game industry, is more than willing to, you know, forgive one gaffe. But uh, if you start making several in a row, yeah, it's. Uh, I don't think it's uh, going to be that forgivable uh, too terribly much. After your first or second gaff, right? Right now, the um, Kickstarter has changed a lot of things uh, in terms yeah. of involving the community. So you know, you mentioned that if somebody's going to edit, then you would expect to pay them. Well, there's one case in which that's not true, and that's that you know, if you if you have done a Kickstarter and you have a bunch of backers, like we have 360. Backers for our last best hope. We and we, yeah. we absolutely take their editor went through our last best hope uh, two or three times and caught you know a whole bunch of stuff that needed to be fixed. But then our backers caught a bunch of typos that both he and I missed and and asked questions about was was this clear is that clear? So what's interesting is you want to yeah. combine I think a, 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 some paid resources like if you you know we have a layout person we're paying to do all of the all of the graphic design. And free resources like your community, like your fan base, and get them involved. It's just a matter of knowing kind of how to do each one. When do I need to pay for it, and when can I count on my fans to help me understand what they want? Yeah, and that's exactly it. You know, Kickstarter has definitely changed the the rules of the game over the last oh heck, even just the last year. Yeah, uh, six months, six months even. Um, you know where. Um, all of these different crowdsourcing sites. So you've got Indiegogo for those of us who are international, right. and Kickstarter for those who are based out of the U.S. You know, it's completely changed the game. You know, now not only are you able to get uh, an influx of, uh, of cash, of capital into your business, you now also have that new resource of, for all intents and purposes, prepaid beta testers. Um, and beta readers for your products. So, you know, a, a smart a smart Kickstarter program will build that into their business model. Um, yeah. I don't know. I'll, I'll be honest. I don't know a lot about the how how the Kickstarter or Indiegogo works. It's something I'm a little hesitant on using personally. Just I I don't like a lot of risk, and you know, some of these Kickstarter and Indiegogo is a bit risky for my taste. But you know, as as Friends and other colleagues in, in the industry have made successes of them. You know, it's starting to make me rethink my business model for a lot of these different uh, crowdsourcing options. Uh, one well, very well, famous. Uh, sir? Go okay, ahead. I was just going to say, I was actually in the same exact uh, <clears throat> position. Um, you know, no, no question that, that I was thinking the Kickstarter was risky. Uh, and I hope everybody comes. There's a Kickstarter panel later today uh, that Chadrick is running, and I'm I'm going to be on. Um, but it's it's funny because you almost at this point for me and for the rest I think for the rest of the industry 
you almost have to talk about Kickstarter now when you're talking yeah. about the business side of yeah. doing role-playing game design because it's so yeah. central. And, and please, when I say Kickstarter, just insert whatever yeah. crowdfunding platform you want to use, Indiegogo, whatever. Yeah. It doesn't matter. Yeah. Um, what, what's, what happens is, is that you actually have very, very little risk. And the reason you have mm. such little risk is you say how much money you need to do this product. So for us, uh, for our last best hope, we said we needed about $3,000. And that's because we did the math and we you know, wrote the budget and we figured out this is how much money we need to make this game. And then yeah. if you don't get to $3,000, if the market doesn't want that game bad enough for you to get enough backers, nothing happens. Yeah. The whole project just doesn't kick. Yeah. So I think there's two places where people get themselves into trouble with Kickstarter, which are actually good, like actually where people usually get themselves into trouble with businesses in general. <laughs> the first one is, if you set your budget too low. So if you say, yeah. I'm going to produce gold-plated role-playing game books at 100 bucks, then, pe when, then people are going to expect you to be able to produce gold-plated role-playing game books. Mm. So you've got to be careful and build a budget that makes sense and be thoughtful mm. about it. And, put, yeah. and, and also, just like you were saying about being professional, you've got to put time and energy into your Kickstarter yeah. video, into your yeah. pitch, and you've got to do all that. And yeah. then two is not being ready for success. So, yeah. you know, with, with the Play is the Thing, our first game, we asked for $500, and we got 5000 And we were almost not ready for that, right? We yeah. weren't ready for this to get that much attention. So yeah. you've got to be ready for sort of both, ready for it to fail uh, and, and put in the effort to try to keep it from failing, but ready for it to succeed and make sure that this makes sense as you get bigger. Yeah. Um, but I yeah. think those things are perfectly true of any business, and Kickstarter yeah. just gives you a good avenue to get started. Yeah, and and that's just it. What you have to what you have to consider is, uh, Mark pointed out just a few seconds ago, is budgets. This idea of budgets, make sure they're realistic budgets. Make sure they're achievable budgets. Make sure they are taking into consideration things that you wouldn't even dream of thinking. You know, um, print costs, your everything. Uh, the budget is going to be your lifeline for anything. Uh, if you needed to go to a bank to, to secure a loan for, so, for, for something, they're going to want to see a budget. They're going to want to see a business plan. They're going to want to see all sorts of business-related documentation in order to make sure you know, you're a viable business. And that's the other thing um, from a tax perspective. The, the ta most tax authorities want to see you as a business, which means you are busy. Uh, you're actually producing something. You know, even if it's only one product in a year, you're still producing something. Now, you'll be able to argue with your IRS, your SCAT, your, you know, um, you know your local tax authorities all you want, but um, you need to be as a business. Um, now, there's several, several ways of going about that, and it's a pretty general, similar thing. In many of the countries, um, one of the one of the big questions is always, should I incorporate or should I be a self uh, self employed? Um, the definitions are a sole proprietorship, self employed, and the big difference between that is if you if you're incorporated, that is a a living entity in and of itself. Um, it's its own tax person. It uh, pays its own taxes. It earns its own money. Uh, with the sole proprietorship, you are the business. So if anything goes tits up in your plans, you're the one who's going to end ultimately be held responsible. With the corporation, not so much. Uh, there's tax, uh, tax implications on both sides. There's tax advantages on both sides. That's, all, that's a whole different, I think, uh, discussion. But it, it, it also bears inclusion in, in this overall high-level discussion as well. Um, yeah, so from my perspective, you know, when we, when we got started, we weren't interested in, in putting the money into forming the corporation because I wasn't yeah. sure well, how much money we were ever going to make uh, and just wasn't, I mean, it costs money to, to do the incorporation and time yeah. and energy. Um, and so I just yeah. set myself up as a sole proprietorship. So even though Marissa yeah. and I are a partnership, we just put everything yeah. in my name, uh, got yeah. a bank account, doing business yeah. as, Magpie Games, all of that. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. and then after the Kickstarter last year, 
you realize, okay, we, we actually have a significant amount of money sort of flowing through this. It's not enough to pay our bills, but it's enough that I'm concerned about making sure my business expenses are separate from my personal expenses, and yeah, so we wouldn't have exactly. it incorporated as an LLC. So yeah, uh, exactly. I, would, I, would, I would urge almost everybody to start as a sole proprietorship because yeah. it's, you can, there's, there's this concept in, in sort of management called work avoidance where yeah. you pick up things that you're going to do that keep you from doing the real work. And I see this yeah. with a lot of game designers. It's like, well, I can't write a game. I have to incorporate. And I can't incorporate because I have to find a logo. And I can't find a logo because, and the list just goes on and on and on. Yeah, and it's like, look, man, just design your game. Yeah, right. And that's got to be that's got to be step one. Is you've got to actually do the work. Yeah, and the, you know that's also a, uh, one of the one of the other. Uh, speaking of you know the uh, one of the other trends, one of the big trends, especially in self publishing, that I've begun to see, is this idea of collectives. We you have one person or a group of people getting together to help each other out in producing and publishing their works. Uh, there's a big movement going on right now on G Plus called Literary Plus, uh, which is exactly that kind of idea. You're a bunch of self-pubs and self-publishers getting together and putting their their products out. <clears throat> Maybe not as a uh, as a group, but everybody's kind of helping each other. And one of the things that I'm hoping to accomplish with Bygone Futures is just that. If there's a self-pub out there who's afraid of the work and the business side of things and just wants to write, you know, give us a shout. We'll help, you know, with the with the marketing of your book, with the <clears throat> getting it edited, getting it set up, and all that. Um, you know, let let those of us who have the experience, who are willing to help, help you guys. You know, it's. Uh, the business world is big and scary, and it doesn't need to be if you are smart about it. You know, use your resources, use your contacts, use those of us who are already done the work to give you a hand in uh, in getting out in the real world. <clears throat> yeah, I I actually run a so on that same sort of note, I run a, uh, a sort of collective um, like mastermind group called the Indie Game Developer Network, and. Um, it, it started off being just for tabletop games. Like, we wanted it to be, um, you know, uh, let's see, who's in the, Brennan Taylor is in the group. He's the guy who wrote Bulldogs um, and a bunch of other games. He wrote Galileo games. Uh, and John Wick, who, you know, is famous, wrote uh, The House of the Blooded and L5R and a couple. And I think Mark's crashed again. Um, okay. I I think I know where he's. Uh, I don't want to pick up for where Mark is at, so I'm just going to uh, let's just take a look at this. Uh, and unfortunately, I don't have control of the Hangout, so I can't even pause it or hold off. So unfortunately, you guys are just going to have to stare at uh, at me for a few few seconds while we uh, work out these tech uh, technical Hmm. Looks like I managed to crash the hangout. Let me <laughs> see if I can get get.
There we go. You back on, Vince? Um, I think so. There we go. Great. <clears throat> okay. Sorry about that. So, um, anyway, go ahead. Where, where, where were we? Uh, I think you were just talking about your indie publishing collective. Oh, right. Yeah. So the, right it's called. You. Yeah. So if you if you're interested in checking it out, it's called the Indie Game Developer Network, and it's sort of the same thing as with Literary Plus, trying to help each other figure out how to do gaming better or game design better. Uh, and it's a very diverse group of people now. We've got uh, you know a video game designer, card game designers, board game designers, because we realize there's a lot of synergy that comes from that. Like the card game people have to come up with hundreds of pieces of art, right, to make yeah. a to make a card game. Well, that's yeah. awesome because they have a roster of artists that they know, like tons of artists, and they know their prices. And for me, yeah. like you know, Marissa and I are realizing that she can do all the art for a small book, but we're gearing up. And and you talk about the one year, three year, five year plan. Our three year yeah. plan includes a major line of books, big mm -hmm. hardcover, full uh, full color art books. There's no way yep. Marissa can do all the pieces of art. No. So she's going to have to transition to being an art director, and yep. these guys are going to help us do that. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, that te one of the most difficult tasks that I think uh, an independent publisher is going to have is the art side of things. Um, and it, it's, put it this way, it's easy to find the artists. It's difficult to manage the artists. Um, and I had a conversation with Andrew Chasen um, a few about a week ago now, with respect to this, because I've been I've got this idea for a little side RPG product based on my uh, based on my novel and short story work, and I said you know basically put it out to to him saying hey, what do I need to know you know uh, playing the complete idiot here. You know, I know right. nothing about art. I know what I like. I know what looks good. I know what I'm kind of in in looking for. How do I get that out into the real world? Because it's not something that I normally deal with. Um, you know, I I'm a words guy. Uh, so we tend to us authors and word type people tend to think a little bit different uh, uh, when it comes to how do we, how we approach different things. And the th what he told me to do is put together what uh, a style guide. And, and, w and I was like, okay, what do you mean? Okay, well, go out in the net, find pieces of art that you think capture what you're looking for, and put up a little style guide. You know, put in this picture, this picture, why do you like this picture, so on and so forth, and then send that out to prospective artists as well as be upfront with what your expectations for cost and payment are going to be. Because there's a lot of artists out there who are going to say, okay, I'll work for free. Well, that's great, but what kind of turnaround, what kind of quality are we going to be looking at? And as with everything, yeah. you're always going to get what you pay for. If, you're, if somebody is willing to put in the time and effort to help you with your product, don't be a dick, pay them. And pay them on time. You know, if you've agreed to pay these guys within 30 days of product release, pay them within 30 days of product release. If you've made an agreement to pay them a percentage of each unit sold, make sure you pay them a percentage of each unit sold. Uh, luckily, I haven't gotten into that situation where I've made so much that I have to pay the people that have assisted me um, yet. But, uh, you know, I, nobody's helped me with my products yet. But, you know, if you do hire on editors or if you do hire on artists and layout people and so on and so forth, pay them. You know, don't, uh, we've been hearing a lot of things over the years, over the last couple of years of uh, creatives getting uh, shafted by companies they've worked for. Uh, it just leaves a bad taste in everybody's mouth. You know, so just uh, take it easy. Make sure you're paying them on time <clears throat> and what you've agreed, because uh, there's nothing that's going to ruin your reputation faster than being known as that guy who doesn't pay his people. You know. Yeah, that's that's true. And and just so people know, um, one good way to structure that relationship is to 
um, really tie it to the editing process. So I did a short story collection last uh, for the last book, and I'm doing another one for this book. And what we did for that was we said, okay, this is what we're willing to pay, uh, two cents a word or fifty dollars yeah. for a twenty-five hundred word short story, and this is what this is how we're going to pay you. Um, you have to yeah. give us a draft by this date, and when you do so, we'll pay you half the money. And then, exactly. And yeah. then I'm going to take some time to edit it, and when I get it back to you, you have ten days or fifteen days to send it back to me as a final draft. And then when you do that, when you submit it to me again, I'll pay you the second half. And then yeah. we wrote in there, if you're late on one of these, then we owe you 10% or 20% less. And yeah. like that just very clearly lays out what, what the process is going to look like. And I would do the same thing for an yeah. artist. You'll send me this yeah. many pieces by this date. I'll get you notes back. You'll make changes, and then we'll do, we'll do exactly. this. Exactly. You know? Yeah. And, and, and the other thing is, you know, get all this in writing, guys. Contracts, yeah. uh, as much as you want to be gentlemen's agreements and you want to be the handshake, get it into a contract because especially if you're going to end up working with friends nothing will destroy a friendship faster than an argument over money you know um, and the key, and the key to the contracts is just keep them simple right yeah. I, if anybody if anybody wants to see a contract that we use please send me a message it's like a yeah. page and a half and and yeah. we actually do we do a number of things through gentlemen's agreements like Editing, for example, happens a lot through gentlemen's agreements. Yep. Like, you know, I'm working with the editor pretty consistently. They don't get paid until I get through. There's, that's fine. But whenever you're yep. going to use somebody's work in the future, like art or stories, like you mm -hmm. need to make sure you have the rights to that. You can't yep. just publish stuff. So yep. if it's somebody else's creative property, then the contract serves two focuses. One is to keep make sure you're safe and protected in the immediate, like, you want to make sure that you get your work and they get paid. But then what happens a year from now, or two years from now, when somebody calls you and says, hey, why are you publishing the short story I wrote? You know, you don't have the rights to it. You need to have your contract to say, actually, you signed this. You said I do yep. have the rights. That's, that's yep. an important thing. Yeah, and it becomes even more important depending on what type of business you, you end up doing business as. If you're if you're doing it as a sole proprietorship, those people will come after you personally. It's going to be your butt on the line when it comes to right. any any liability. Uh, with a cor with a corporation, it becomes the corporation's problem. So there's those kind of uh, risk reward ratio, risk reward uh, thoughts that also enter the process uh, when deciding whether you want to be a sole proprietorship or or incorporate. Again, you know, there's there's some cost uh, costs involved there with incorporation. I know here in Denmark, the last I looked into it, it costs, I think it was, fifty thousand kroner. So that's what about ten thousand US that you have to have as physical capital uh, in order to start the incorporation process. Uh, some other countries, it, it doesn't cost anything. So outside of the lawyer's fees to draft up your minutes and whatnot. So, you know, just do your research on that side. As always, too, if, you, if there's any questions, always, you can always give us a shout. Um, you know, if there's any specific questions that, in, that you may have. Uh, I, I think we're one, actually... One, yeah, one thing we should talk about, I think, is um, we talked a little bit about how social media and like the Internet mm. changing things. We didn't really get yep. a chance to talk about how you can screw yourself over um, yep. with social media. And I think we saw that in the last um, probably six months. There's been a number yep. of like what we might politely call kerfluffles um, yep. in, the, in the gaming community. Um, and I don't, I don't want to rehash any of those fights. That's not the point. I don't, I don't even necessarily want to get into them for this exact reason, mm -hmm. which is that if you're going to take a stand on an issue, um, especially if it's one that's sensitive or potentially harmful or hurtful to others, you want to be very careful with how you go about approaching that issue from a business mm -hmm. perspective. I mean, I would give you that advice person to person as well, but from a business perspective, you need to realize that people are not going to separate your brand from who you are. So you, exactly. can, you, you can say like, oh, I'm just talking as Mark, right? But like, there's only like two people that work at Mag Magpie Games, so I'm kind of talking as Magpie Games. And yep. with that in mind, you know, if I come out and I say things like, I think Star Wars is the worst movie ever. People are gonna be like, okay, we'll give him some, give him some, uh, you know, yeah. guff for that. But if I come out and start yeah. making comments about 
uh, any number of, of sensitive issues surrounding marginalized communities, then mm -hmm. people may not just like give me a tough time. They may be really angry and hurt. Yeah. So yeah. you know you have to be really careful with social media because everything that you say is um, I think as Chuck yeah. one day put it, it's hooked up to the internet. You really like your computer is hooked yeah. up to the internet, and be careful. Yeah. Yeah, uh, th this idea of privacy and private conversations nowadays, especially once the internet in is involved, it it's everything is fair game. You know, you've really got to be careful about what you say, where you say it, and how you say it. Uh, especially if the primary method of communication is text-based, a lot, a lot, a lot of the gaffes and the kerfuffles. Not just in recent weeks, not just in you know the G plus community, not just in the gaming community, everywhere. A misread sentence. You you give this one sentence to two diff different people. Those two different people are going to interpret that sentence differently, um, and then the person who wrote the sentence is going to have a completely different. Uh, meaning or interpretation behind it. So it becomes very, very important that your written communication is clear, it's concise, it's to the point. Um, having lived here in Denmark for as long as I have now, for the last five or six years, one thing that I love about the Danes, and it annoys a lot of people, is their bluntness and their directness. They are, I, I have this phrase, they are about as subtle as sledgehammers, you know. They tell you exactly what's on their mind. I grew up in Canada, very much, very, very similar to an American or the, the U.S. Right. mindset. We tend to walk around issues. We tend to step around those sensitive topics. My wife, she'll look at me if I start doing that, and then she gives me that look, and Every married male, every male in a relationship knows that look, um, and you know you've just done it. So, yeah, in your written word, be very short, very concise, and very clear. You don't be afraid to use smileys. One, and this is a, a communication course I took some time ago, said avoid smileys. In online communication, it's those smileys and those uh, emoticons that actually help convey the hidden meanings behind what you're trying to communicate. So don't be terribly afraid of using those things in your online communication. Because that, that smiley, that winky, that whatever you want to call it, in your written communication will help convey the message you want it to get out. Um, so I know some people are going to disagree with me on that issue, but for me, the, it, adding a smiley to a sentence changes the meaning of that sentence. And I think for a lot of people, it will help clarify the meaning behind those sentences. Um, but again, don't use smileys in professional communication, <laughs> you know. But in, in, especially in social, commu in social communities, in your G+, in your Twitter, in your Facebook profiles, and wherever, be, don't be afraid to be, use informal uh, communication methods. Don't use leet speak. For, don't use the, the lull speak or whatever the heck the term is. But, you know, use full sentences, use clear sentences, but also include these smiley faces because that does help tremendously in getting your point across. And it also helps to have people that you know who don't think like you. Um, so, for example, you know, if you're, if you're sort of, the, I mean, I, I know our industry is very male-dominated. Um, it's usually white male-dominated. Um, and a lot of the problems have come about when, when people... Uh, are making statements about stuff where maybe they don't know the full story, right? So yeah. if there's yeah. issues of race or gender and you don't have any friends that are of a different race or gender than you to run it by, maybe you should yeah. find some, right? So <laughs> think yeah. and, and, you know, go to people and say like, hey, um, you know, if you've got friends that are, and we all have friends that are women, I mean, that's, that shouldn't be that hard to cross, hopefully, go yeah. to a friend who's a woman and say, hey, I wrote this article 
uh, about women in gaming, and I just wanted to run it past you. Yep. You know, and and if if she gives you that look, that like, did you mean to say what you said here? Look, then <laughs> maybe you should think about how women across yeah. the entire internet are going to think about that. Um, yeah, exactly. So just you know, this this combination of being clear, but also just like being mindful, like thinking about what are yeah. what am I saying, and is, do I know anybody who can kind of vet what I'm saying and make sure it's yeah. coming across the way I want it to. Um, exactly. Because it's hard. It's hard. Yeah. Oh yeah. And, and that's just it. We're and just to be clear, we're not talking about self censorship or anything like that. Everybody has the right to their own opinions. Everybody has the right to express their opinions, but be prepared for the fallout when other people don't share your same opinion. Um, so you know, just be just be mindful of other other people's reactions to your work, especially as a self pub. Um, and it, it, it's a tough pill to swallow sometimes, and you know, you, the end. Most of the time, you'll come out stronger at the uh, through the end of, at the end of it. So, uh, was there anything else? I don't see any comments or questions popping up anywhere. So the, the uh, I think maybe the best thing for us to do then to wrap up would be maybe to talk about each of our sort of long term plans. Uh, they sure. like you know short, medium, and long, and, and give yep. people an example of what that sort of business yep. plan looks like. So yep. uh, that'll do work. You want to go first? Um, well, my basically my my short term plan right now is very much dependent on my day job situation. Um, because I work as a senior accountant, I really only have two to three months in a year where I can actually focus 100% of my time or my energy outside of the office on my projects. So uh, we're very much a peak and valley type of business. So right now my short term goal as I mentioned earlier in, in the broadcast was I want to finish a second short story this year. I'm very nearly done. I think I'm about 4,000 words in and I'm shooting for between five and seven and a half thousand. So we're very close to finishing the first draft of that. I want to finish my novel this year. That's my ultimate goal, is to have the novel completely written and published by the end of the year. I'm sitting at 98, 99,000 words at the moment. I had a goal of 90, which was written before I went in for my surgeries at the end of April. Uh, I started writing it in the end of February. By the end of April, I had 90,000. Uh, then I had uh, carpal tunnel surgery on both hands, so that put me out of action for the better part of the last couple of months. So now I'm back into it. We're sitting at 99,000 words right now, unedited. I'm still not done. Uh, I'm creeping towards the final scene, so I'm hoping to finish that up uh, during my vacation here coming up. So that's very close to finished. Um, I also have two role-playing game related products I hope to issue. Uh, one is a line of NPC related um, short products based on each of the novels or each of the short stories. So the, the characters and the creatures and the monsters that the hero encounters in the, in the uh, short story are going to become uh, NPC write-ups for use in whatever game system you want to use. Uh, it's going to be sy they're system neutral products. Any role playing game product I produce will likely be system neutral. I think that's going to be the wave of the future for supplements. Is as there's so many uh, systems out there right now, everybody has their favorite system, but not every system has support material. Uh, and so I think that's my goal is to produce those. Uh, as far as medium and longer range goals. I would love for this to become my full-time job. I don't see it happening within the next five years, just because of the state of the market and the state of the economy right now, uh, worldwide. So, um, the next couple of years, I hope to have another novel out by the end, by mid 2014. I hope to have. It'd be nice if I could have another novel out next year, but I think I'm gonna step back on the novels and just focus on short stories. So I think next year I'm going to shoot for, you know, a half a dozen more short stories and possibly an anthology of my own writing uh, out next year. So, yeah, it's right now I'm just kind of taking things a year at a time. 
as uh, the day job allows. Uh, That's what, great. What, yeah, so what have you got on the, the works right now? Sure, so this, uh, the, at Gen Con, we're going to be really releasing our last Best Hope, um, which is the Kickstarter we just finished in June. And um, over the next, like, probably four months after that, I'll be responsible for getting our two stretch goals done, which is the companion book that contains additional resources and some essays from me on how to make the game really work, uh, like, extra awesome once you've learned the basics, and uh, new play sets and things in that book. Uh, and then, we'll, of course, our anthology of short stories called Weird Dust. That's, uh, mm -hmm. that's going to be attached to that book as well. Um, so that'll probably take me the rest of the year. I mean, to be honest, yeah. you know, I'm a student, so uh, you know, fall and spring are really rough for me. A lot of my work gets done in the months, you know, December to January, and then over the summer. Right. So that's yeah. that's when I, as a graduate student, have time. Uh, but graduate school is going to end next year in May, so I should have a bit more of a flexible schedule. Um, so you know, next this this fall might happen at Gen Con, might be a little later. We're going to release uh, some Ashcan slash open beta material for our next game, Eternity, which is about uh, playing a god. Uh, and uh, okay. it's a gemless game where you play a god and your friends all play gods. And uh, anything you say goes as long as no other god opposes you. Um, but it's also a game about desire and about what we want and how we trap ourselves with our own wants um, through this lens of sort of deities. Uh, you play not just yourself, but a whole group of uh, pantheon around you, your children, your okay. priests, your monsters. Uh, so it's a really cool game we've been working on for a long time, and it's it's a much bigger game than right. these one-shot games we've been working on. I mean, you know, for right. me, the, Our Last Best Hope and uh, The Play is the Thing are the RPG equivalent of short stories, right? They're, right. they're 20,000 words, 25,000 words. They're designed to be played in a single session, which means I don't have right. to worry about tracking experience or building characters between sessions. It just when you sit down and you play, it's over. Eternity is different. Eternity is probably going to be closer to 40,000 words. Um, it's going to have a lot more material. It's designed to be played for years, like not just one session, but many, many, many sessions. And so right. we're going to really try that out in public and then probably do a Kickstarter for it next April, right around PAX East. Mm -hmm. And then we'll get the book out by Gen Con and maybe talk about doing one more sort of smaller book like Our Last Best Hope, but that'll be it. I mean, you know, doing a big Kickstarter, uh, you know, a big book, getting it out, you know, getting everything wrapped up in April, but getting it out by August, that's going to take up the rest of my year, you know, from yeah. this year to next year. So yeah. medium-term goals, Marissa and I are working on a game called Skybound, uh, which is much more of like, we see it as much more like a DD and d kind of game. Like, it's going to be big books, you know, the, with the yeah. hardbound, color, art, all of that. Um, also one that's really open to sort of non-narrativist players, so people who want to yeah. just roll dice, uh, you know, and, and explore dungeons, we want to make a game that sort of has that option in there. Um, and the yeah. plot of Skybound is basically that there's these cultures in this uh, fantasy world, and you play the people who have been sort of kicked out or exiled or chosen to leave those cultures. So you're all outsiders who have been bound together uh, in this case, the first set of game, or the first book for the game, uh, in sky ships, like people who go between the cultures uh, and and are smugglers or cargo people, uh, and so you know we really want to get that sense of being exiled from a culture, but always carrying it with you, right? Like never right. being comfortable anywhere, uh, and and but also having this big expansive world with you know art and monsters and you know all of that kind of thing. So very much a, a fantasy kind of game. Uh, that draws on inspirations like Nausicaa by, uh, by Miyazaki, um, right. things like Dragon Age, which I thought did a great job of capturing sort of cultural yeah. clashes. Um, so kind of yeah. making that kind of the point of the game. But again, you can see we're, we're ramping up, right? It's, going, it's yeah. going up. You start off with something exactly. small like a black and white 6 by 9 book, and two yeah. or three or four years down the road, we'd like to put together a book that looks every bit as good as a Dungeons & Dragons book sitting on the shelf. Yeah. Um, and that's a big goal for us, and we, we're not ready yeah. for it today. If you yeah. asked me to produce that book today, we couldn't do it. So no. we've got to build that capacity over time. Yeah, and that's just it. That's, uh, I think, something that uh, we can't really stress enough. Nothing is ever going to happen overnight. You know, you're, you've really got to kind of take things in small, manageable steps. It's the same as any goals. You know, they need to be small, measurable, achievable steps uh, in order for them to be meaningful to you as a business owner, as somebody who wants to do this uh, in a full-time capacity. Um, but I think... I think, you know, we, when you talk about overnight success, I think 
um, I don't know if you, you saw it, but there's a Kickstarter for Dinopocalypse yep. Now, uh, or Dinocalypse Now, which is the, the evil hat fiction line. Yep. And they hit like eight, this is like ridiculous, like yeah. $40,000 um, for this for these yeah. books. And if you looked at that from the outside looking in, you might say, oh, that was an overnight success. They just had this, this perfect book, and it just really clicked. Yeah. I was like, man, Evil Hat's been around for forever. They've done yeah. so many books and so much work. Yeah. And Fred Hicks, you know, the guy, the the, the guy who's Evil Hat, uh, you know, among all the other people that work there. But Fred is just like such a big part of the community. He's this amazingly yeah. sweet guy. Um, yeah. You know, every time I see him, he's just he's just so full of warmth and energy. And and yeah. he's done that for years. And so this overnight yeah. success is really. It's not overnight. Yeah. It's it's years not long exactly. and deserved, yeah. and it, and it takes a long time to get there. And then when it happens, it's yeah. gonna feel like it's overnight, gonna look like it's yeah. overnight, but it was not. No, exactly. And that's just it. Everything takes time. You know, anything worth doing is going to take time to do. Um, you yeah. know, it's uh, you know, I I was surprised when I sold my 15 copies of my short story. You know, for me that was fantastic, and it's only 15 copies. Um, right. You know, uh, will I ever see more than the 15? I hope so. I hope being involved with something like Indie Plus is going to get my name out there, for better or for worse. I'm now immortalized on the internet on both a, a breakout game or a Marvel game from last night, and now the the Indie panel tonight. So. Anyways, I think that about wraps up everything that we had on plan, Mark. Um, thanks, everyone, for tuning in. Hopefully, you found some useful information in everything. Uh, feel free to drop myself or Mark a line on G+, if you have any questions. Uh, more than willing to talk about our experiences, both offline and online, uh, if you wanted to hang out. Uh, just drop us a line. Just uh, bear in mind, I'm in Denmark, so I'm about six or seven hours ahead of most of the U.S. Uh, and, uh, only I'm an hour. In, I'm in Houston slash Boston, so I'm pretty solidly yeah. inside the U.S. So yeah. Um, so and I guess one one last final piece of advice: go to cons. I mean, go. Yeah. Make the time to go. Yeah. If you want to do yeah. game design, make the time to go. And this is a, I mean. Huge thanks to all the all the people who put this together because this is doing yeah. a little bit of that without you actually having to buy a plane ticket. Um, exactly. But it's worth it. It's worth it for yeah. the people you meet. And you, know, you sit down and have a drink with somebody, and they're going to trust you more in the future. They're going to look at you eye to eye and know you're somebody they want to work with. So yeah. definitely worth exactly. it. Exactly. Yeah. Get involved in the community, people. Yes. Um, yeah. You know, just you know, even you know, I I count among my friends, you know, Sean Patrick Fannin. He's a brilliant guy. He's he's one of the nicest men I've ever met. Uh, I met him while I was doing the Savage Worlds work for uh, for Digital Adventures all those years ago. And I still, he's a he's a fantastic guy. I sadly don't get to chat with him very much anymore. Uh, we're both very busy people, and the time difference certainly doesn't help. But you know, he, he's a great guy. Uh, there's so many wonderful people I've met uh, from being even behind the scenes uh, over the years. That uh, you know, just get involved, ask the questions, approach. Most of these game designers, they're not good at uh, bite, so don't be afraid to ask them. Uh, just remember, there's no such thing as a stupid question. There might be. You know, so just ask the question. You know, the yeah. only stupid question, the only stupid question is the question that remains unanswered or unspoken. Sorry. So j go ahead, ask the questions, and I hope you all have found this to be enjoyable. Anyways. Yeah. Thank you, guys. Thanks for having me on. And not a problem. Take care, guys. Thanks.